Hi, I'm Kristen Goodwillie. Thanks for joining us right here on WHAS 11. We're taking a look back at some of the big stories this year. Over the course of 2021, there were a number of events that left their mark on the Commonwealth. Some of those stories are ones of struggle, while others are ones of success. And we were here with you every step of the way on your side. We start with one of those stories that caught your eye the ongoing chip shortage, and it was hard to miss the hundreds and hundreds of Ford trucks sitting idle at the Kentucky Speedway. Tom Lally took a look. I love Fords. The Raiders have owned Fords for years. In fact, we had three Ford, three Ford trucks at one time. My little Thunderbird's a Ford. A few weeks ago, when they saw brand new trucks being unloaded at the Kentucky Speedway, they thought it was odd. I have never seen anything like this. Now, more and more trucks are showing up. If I was going to guess, I'd say about 10,000. <laughs> Mike and Pat snapped a picture that's now been shared from Dayton to Los Angeles. Overnight, we were almost at 1,000, and then it went to 2,000, and today it's at 2,100 shares. It's not just the stunning image that's making headlines, but the reason all of these trucks are here in the first place. Remember that semiconductor shortage we've been covering? It's a little computer chip that's facing a global shortage, pushing forward to change hours, shifts, and sometimes even close its Kentucky truck plant. Now they're making the trucks with everything but the chip and just waiting for the finishing piece. I'm glad that they're doing it that way. So that way they keep the factories running in Louisville. But this is not just a Kentucky issue. Because this is not the only lot now filled with Fords. The problem is faced across the globe by a variety of automakers. In America, the U.S. Senate already passed a potential solution. The Chips for America Act would provide financial incentives to make more semiconductors in the United States. Right now, Ford spokesperson Kelly Felker tells me Ford will hold on to these trucks for weeks, then ship the vehicles to dealers once the modules are available and comprehensive quality checks are complete. A makeshift solution and a sea of excitement for Kentucky Ford fans. There's a sea of trucks up here. <laughs> for WHAS, I'm Tom Lally. But the chip shortage wasn't the only problem plaguing the Commonwealth throughout the year. So was the supply of workers. Over the summer, a number of businesses were looking to fill seasonal jobs, but were having trouble getting younger workers in the door. Another trend we also saw in the workforce this year was the number of walkouts across the country, and Louisville was no different. Here at home, workers at two area restaurants walked off the job, saying they were tired and overworked. Co-owner of the Mayan Cafe in Nulu and Shadle says staffing challenges aren't unique to any restaurant. I'm sad for the employees that haven't felt appreciated. I'm sad for the companies that are missing opportunities to, to run their organizations better. Other business owners we talked to said the model has completely shifted from getting new workers in the door, but also keeping them around. And those job shortages trickled all the way down to the most unexpected places, even our local school districts. I love doing what I do. When our story first aired in August, there were over 1,100 job openings among five of the area's biggest school districts. So we asked a bus driver of 15 years his, thought, his thoughts on why the job is in high demand and the challenges ahead. The application process and the people who qualify to become bus drivers, you're not always going to get 20 applicants and 20 going to come through. So with the demand, with everybody trying to recruit drivers, um, it has been challenging. Luckily, the districts managed with the shortage and were able to pick up where they left off with getting kids to class. I don't, know, but I don't even know what to think right now, actually. It's hard to even put stuff into words. I don't know how to really don't know how to feel. I feel let down by my employer. Very, very disappointed in my employer. But those worker walkouts weren't just at local restaurants. Hundreds of Heaven Hill employees went on strike in September. The distillery workers said they were trying to negotiate with the company over a new contract, but weren't being heard. Eventually, workers got a new contract with pay raises, more vacation days, and set work schedules. However, not everyone was happy with that outcome. The strike lasted for about six weeks. 
Earlier in the year, before there was a worker shortage, there were plenty of businesses sprouting up more than three hours southeast of Louisville. The idea came from the man behind the East Street Market and the Nulu neighborhood. Entrepreneur Gil Holland wanted to bring something fresh to the table while getting back to his roots in Harlan, Kentucky. Sitting in the heart of Appalachia. It's the most famous county in America, Harlan County, USA. Who hasn't heard of it? Bloody Harlan, known for the strife between coal companies and its miners. Remnants of the near century long fight continue today, most recently when Black Jewel filed for bankruptcy, leaving many Kentucky miners without paychecks. A memorial stands in the center of downtown. Harlan County built the city of Louisville. Harlan County built the United States of America, if you think about the amount of coal that came out of this uh, county. And across the street, a building. This is a hundred plus year old building right here on the courthouse square. One that sat empty for nearly a decade. This is where it's all gonna happen. Until now. And then you'll see the bar straight ahead of you. Curb bar will have either reclaimed wood as the bar or we'll get a, ch a big hunk of uh, locally milled wood for our bar. Gil Holland, uh, who's known for creating Nulu, partnered up with entrepreneur Jeff Marietta to buy the building in late 2019. It will become Harlan's first microbrewery, just as the town voted to allow liquor. There's a strong tradition of moonshine making and here in the mountains. Harlan County Beer Company will be the first legal brewery in Harlan and the only one within 100 miles. Why Harlan? We have this urban rural divide and we need more people to create the urban rural bridge. Pouring in resources to a county with depleting jobs and people. It's the path Harlan is currently on. There is a movement in Harlan and there's a movement in other Eastern Kentucky towns. Jeff and his wife, Sky moved back to Harlan after living in Boston for 11 years. They opened a coffee shop on Main Street only months before the pandemic. So often when we think of rural communities, we're thinking about extraction, taking things out, and that's how you build a community. And a big push here is to import people. Small towns are making a comeback. A block down on Main Street, small business owner April Collins says the community she lives in is thirsty for change. We believe that, that Harlan has so much potential that we're willing to invest all that we have to, to make it a go. That potential refreshing investors like Holland, who's now brewing a bridge between urban and rural. Maybe they'll come for the beer and stay for the mountains. For years, I lived this double life. From living a double life to fighting her battle with addiction, how a popular teacher turned her life around and what she says her community needs for people fighting addiction. Not only did we share stories of struggle, but we also focused on stories of strength this year. Haley Minogue introduced us to a proud Afro-Latina woman and Kentucky's 2019 Teacher of the Year. But inside, she was also fighting an inner battle with addiction. Oftentimes, our black and brown communities are underserved with outlets for addiction recovery. This is her story in her own words. My father was black, but he was Cuban. Or he was rather, he was black and he was Cuban. My mom is Costa Rican. I'm a first generation American. Um, and so then I'll also say like, you know, like I'm half Cuban, half Costa Rican. I, I almost feel like there's so many different ways to say it. So I came to Louisville back in 2012. And at that time I was with my then spouse. So he and I came cause it was more affordable to live here than in New York. And um, I mean, I pretty much fell in love. I started working at the Academy at Shawnee. I started working straight off the bat here in GCPS schools. And um, pretty much I taught until I resigned back in December, but I worked in Jefferson County, Oldham County, and then I came back to Jefferson County the last three years to work at the W.B. Du Bois Academy. 
it's wonderful to just feel like home. Like I had to leave in the middle of the school year because I was not well and I was not gonna make it to the end of the school year. And there wasn't a single person in that building who judged me for having to take care of myself first. So anybody who knows my story knows that I have secretly been struggling with addiction to alcohol, alcoholism, however you wanna call it. And you know, for years I lived this double life where I could be this incredibly successful teacher and really functional community member, but then I was also living in shame and drinking my life away like once I finish my duties for the day. I think in black and brown communities, there is this thing where, you know, there's a huge mental health stigma. Somebody had to finally stop it. And so I think that in our communities, um, it is so important for women who look like me to be like, yes, I have struggled and I need help. I get help. And if I don't keep getting this help, I'm gonna fall apart right in front of you. And it's okay to say that, you know, and I feel so, powerful when I can say those things. I'm confident that I had to go through this journey to be exactly where I am. So in my darkest moment, if I right now could look back at myself and say anything, I would say, you're going to get through this. You are going to get through this. What's the secret ingredient for a soccer team to take the win, but also inspire to strive for greatness? A little girl here in Louisville has that answer. Her smile never stops and her energy never drops. It's fair to say she's one of Racing Louisville's biggest fans and she's a perfect example of how representation on the professional level can be so inspiring for little girls like her whose passion is so clear. Tyler Griever and photojournalist Jessica Farley has this amazing story. To my BFF for life, you have forever changed my life. Ellie Hurley is crazy about her cats. I never really thought of the women's basketball team coming to see me. And smitten with sports. I love sports so much because of, like, the intenseness. For somebody who can't play sports right now, I don't know that I've really ever seen somebody who loves them as much. It's because they help a nine-year-old belong in the middle of a battle. Sometimes she feels kind of alone in the world. Ellie was diagnosed with leukemia at the age of three. She endured two years of heavy treatment before kindergarten. Then in 2019, a relapse came with the disease affecting her head and spinal fluid. She had to do radiation. She's lost her hair, I think five times total at this point. And um, for a little girl to lose her hair, it's really super hard. I keep my spirits up with spending time with my mom. Which includes a new sport to obsess over. She watched the U.S. Women's National Team. That's all that it took and she was hooked after that. It was the first time that she saw a girl doing something professionally. I didn't know there was such thing as girls soccer and it's I think it's much cooler to me because I'm a girl. She was really excited to play soccer this year, but she couldn't because she's got her port. Um, and if that gets damaged, we have to go immediately to the hospital. And you guess what mommy bought today? Instead, her mom bought tickets for Racing Louisville FC's inaugural match. We have soccer tickets. Yay! For her just to get to see that there were people who were excited that she was going to come and that, um, you know, kind of were cheering for her to be here was just awesome. A season ticket holder then gave them their club seats. She's just over the moon excited right now. You could see it from there, <laughs> under a rainbow, or through the rain. She feels like she's a part of everything that's going on. Including the moment resonating for any memory of this match. In the final minutes, racing trails two to one. A free kick sails 
Header falls, and Hero emerges. Soon, Ellie hopes to be. The disease is in remission with the end of treatment scheduled for July 20th. And as racing's players fall in love with this little girl, seeing them play for the first time shows her she can be just like them. I've always tried to tell her that it doesn't matter. You know, she can do whatever she wants. It means so much to me. It's very inspiring that all these girls can do so much. This year, Louisville also saw thousands of fans from across the country make their way to the Derby City, but not just for the running of the roses, but for the NWSL championship between the Chicago Red Stars and the Washington Spirit at Lynn Family Stadium. Now, the game was originally supposed to be in Portland, but players pushed to move the game to Louisville because of the new stadium. Washington Spirit ended up taking home the win, and our racing Louisville players were there to cheer them on. Ellie who we just told you about was also in the stands with her favorite racing players. Not only was she excited to be there, but she was equally as excited to tell us what she was cancer free. I have grown to enjoy the games very much more because I am learning more about soccer. That's why I'm getting better inside of soccer itself. I love that hair. We also learned that Ellie picked up the game herself and played this year on her own soccer team. Frontline workers were not only dealing with the pressures of caring for others with COVID, but also overcrowding at the Commonwealth's hospitals. How the governor responded and the reason behind that decision. Early in the fall, Jefferson County experienced another surge in COVID cases, further putting pressure on area hospitals. But it wasn't just ours here in the River City. In fact, across the Commonwealth, medical centers were being stretched thin. The governor eventually called in the National Guard to assist with the staffing shortage and the surge of people. Luckily, their hard work and help paid off. As cases started to trend downward in the fall, and officials were taking a look at calling them back from their duties. We're actually looking at plans and future plans on the National Guard. Um, what's expected is that we'll begin as hospitals get in a better place to draw down some, uh, but not all, um, of our deployed guardsmen. The governor said the hospitals would still have support in some way, but also allow guardsmen to get back to their families. But one way the Commonwealth was looking to get cases to go down, giving people a shot at winning a million dollars. Yep, that is right, a million bucks. And it also gave students the opportunity to win scholarships where they could use the money at any of the state's colleges, universities, or trade schools. Over the course of the contest, three people won the million dollar prize, including a woman from Louisville, plus dozens of students got money for school. If you haven't gotten your shot, go get it. Protect your family and get qualified for this amazing opportunity. If you're on the fence, how about a free ride to college? Or how about the best odds that you will ever have at winning a million dollars? All you gotta do is the right thing that every public health official in America says you ought to be doing anyways. Roughly 50,000 students entered their name for the scholarship drawing and over 760,000 people entered the shot at a million contest. 
While some were taking a shot at a million, others were taking another shot at growing their own food during the pandemic. Brooke Hash discovered a budding trend that might be out in your backyard. The pandemic not only forced us home last year, it also forced us to come up with alternatives to the higher food prices and smaller budgets. Over in Memphis, Indiana, Deb Harder turned to her garden. You name it, we pretty much grow it here. When she can't find the essentials in the grocery store. We can just shop the pantry. And better yet. It's not full of preservatives. It's just, it goes straight from the garden to my house into the jars. There's no middleman involved. And then there's the taste. There's no comparison. Deb Harder cans, freezes, or dehydrates just about everything she picks. It'll, it'll last for years. I've got tomatoes that we're still eating that I canned in 2017. <laughs> Growing up on a farm, gardening wasn't a huge stretch for Harder, but it's helped stretch her bottom dollar quite a bit during the last year. Take these tomatoes you can get for about $3 at your local grocery store. So that'll last you about a week or two. Or you could plant one and feed your family for the entire year at the same price. Small scale greenhouses have also become a new hot spot. So I've got habanero and scotch bonnet and jalapeno. Allowing people to plant earlier than usual. Last year in Louisville, 30% of gardeners said they saved a total of $500 or more on groceries during the growing season. So what do you do if you don't have the space for your own garden? Turns out Louisville has plenty of community gardens around town, more than 30 of them. 7th Street Community garden is the largest community garden in um, Louisville Metro. We're standing on 15 acres of property that is owned by MSD and this garden has 260 garden plots. So that is um, over 300 families who are accessing this location to grow food. Another 80 families are on the wait list. You can feed your family for most of the year on two 30 by 30 garden plots. Some of the things that you're used to eating, you can't find in a grocery store. So community gardens like this give um, our international community a great space to grow food that is important to them and their diets and their cultures. The 10 gardens managed by the Jefferson County Co-op Extension saw a 25% increase in enrollment last year. Unfortunately, they also saw a spike in theft. People desperate to survive in neighborhoods lacking proper nutrition. The, the most heartbreaking thing about it is everyone here would say what we're sad about is if folks had asked, we would have given it to them. Last year, 20% of gardeners reported having one or more people become dependent on them for food. Ted King, who's the king of cabbage in this garden, is known for what he gives away. Most of the time I just grew up, just give it away, you know, church members and like somebody ride by here, can I have this? I just give it to them, you know, it's, it's a form of, uh, you know, giving back. And if there was ever a question of what to do, he's in good company. Just a mile up the road is Vaughn Barnes, the owner of Kentuckiana Backyard Farms. It's more about knowing where my food's coming from. In the heart of the Taylor Berry neighborhood are the sounds of goats and chickens. Nutritionally, I know what I'm feeding my animals, so I know what I get from them. He gets his milk straight from the goats and the eggs. Before the pandemic, I was the crazy guy with chickens. I was just like, dude, you from the city, you ain't supposed to have chickens. And then after, you know, things happened, Kroger was shutting down and you couldn't get stuff from Walmart. I became everybody's new best friend. Barnes says if enough people became backyard farmers, all of us would be doing our own thing, but we could trade amongst each other. Building communities with deep roots throughout Louisville and Southern Indiana. It's easy, it's fun, um, it's also a great stress reliever. I know we're all a little tense after a year plus of COVID, um, so it's a great way to get outside and, you know, help your mind, help your body, and then eat some great food at the end. Brooke Hash, WHAS 11 News. A story of a dog's survival rallies the community and the country around the meaning of hope. How his recovery inspired all of us next.
One of the biggest stories of this year wasn't about the impact of the pandemic, but about a pup found severely dehydrated and malnourished. His story of survival would go on to inspire us all as we watched him go from brinks of death to discovering a new life. We do want to warn you, some of what you see and hear could be hard to watch. He was just so weak and he was essentially just dying right there in front of us. The roughly three year old dog now named Ethan was found by someone dropping off a donation on Friday and a girl scooped him up and, and ran him back to vet services. And at that time we just dropped everything and started working on him. He was breathing and had a heartbeat, but a temperature wouldn't read. He was close to death. I've never seen anything so dehydrated ever. In the first 12 to 24 hours, Ethan began to decline. Supplies overseas donated special fluids that have been working well for him. And every time I see him, um, he's a little bit better. He can perk his ears up. I saw him wag his tail once or twice. It's been round the clock care for the last couple of days. Everything he has is going to just surviving. Each movement is a triumph. The fact that he can now lap up water on his own shows the miracle of his survival. Gosh, I want him to make him so bad. <laughs> but he's still only 38 pounds when the shelter guesses he should be closer to 80 plus. Anything could happen though, and I, I realized that um, he's just he's so sick. Based on Ethan's condition, staff believe he was locked in a crate without food for weeks. I choose to believe that someone was trying to do the right thing once they found this dog. And after spending a few days at the animal hospital, he was able to be transferred to its main facility. At that point, Ethan still needed constant care and they were cautiously optimistic he'd pull through. In recovery, he spent time in his very own nursery with toys and treats donated by the community. Ethan's story of hope in a time with so much sadness and strife brought people together in a way that is almost unheard of nowadays, especially in social media comments. This dog has just surpassed all expectations. You know, I thought he'd be months and months in rehab and he's he just got up and walked. The community rallied around Ethan, sending him food, donated personalized blankets, toys, treats, and cards. Donations even poured in from people around the country. As he recovered, Ethan's fun-loving personality has started to peek out, but his story also shed light on the tough realities that shelters frequently face. We see horrible, terrible, gut-wrenching stories all the time. And those donations not only helped Ethan get his spirits back up, but also help other animals at KHS. After more than a month of being in recovery, Ethan finally found a permanent home, but it was one he was already familiar with. Humane Society employee Jeff Calloway and his family fostered Ethan during his recovery, but realized that he was too special to let go, so they adopted him. Calloway is the facilities director at the Kentucky Humane Society. He got to see Ethan grow during the recovery process and said Ethan has easily blended into their home routine and instantly became a member of the family. I wanted to do anything I could for him, whether that was foster him or help take care of him or whatever it was. And, you know, after coming in and, and taking care of him at nighttime and then him coming to our home, he just got along so well with our animals and, and everyone fell in love with him. It just seemed natural for him to, to stay. Ethan later received a special proclamation from the Louisville Metro Council. Council President David James presented the proclamation to Ethan and his owner, Jeff Calloway, for their work to raise awareness